And I was like, nobody should be that terrified yeah. of the police yeah. anywhere. I was living in Ethiopia before I came to Ghana and I had an experience with the police. And this was during, you know, during the height still of COVID. And the rule, one of the rules um, was that you could not have more than three people in a car at a time. And I had gone to see a friend. I was with a friend and I had gone to see another friend. Um, and my friend offered to give us a ride home. And, and my friend who he was in a wheelchair because he had had an accident. And so uh, we could just forgot. We forgot about the rules. So we're driving and there is a fork in the road and we're supposed to go left, but we were veering over to the right. The corner of my eye, I saw a police officer uh, on a motorcycle. And first I didn't think much about it, but then as we're veering to the right, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we're getting pulled over. I was so scared. All right, so Adua, thank you so much for joining me on my platform today. Uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, tell the audience about you. Well, hello everyone, and thank you, Anon, for having me on your show. I really appreciate this opportunity to tell my story. I know you kind of talked about it on one of your earlier videos, so I'm glad that I'm able to come on live and just, you know, and talk with you and your audience. My name is Sonjai Davis. Everyone calls me Ajua. Um, and I live in Ghana, West Africa. I am from Washington, D.C., but I am a, a descendant of, of family from Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the surrounding areas. Um, I have lived in Ghana for the past year and a half. Uh, yeah, almost a year and a half. And uh, I am a therapist. Um, I have a practice in, based in Washington, D.C., and I also do uh, international dating and relationship coaching for women coming over here to uh, Ghana, uh, making the transition. I have a, um, a nonprofit uh, that helps women transition safely and effortlessly, uh, learning to navigate uh, the, uh, the waters of Ghana. And uh, just, you know, to find their peace and happiness. Wow, that's awesome. You're a woman of uh, many hats. Um, I do. So... <laughs> I, I have lots of other hats, too, but I just yeah. didn't go into all of that. But... Wow. I'm going to put address information at the bottom in the description box. So if you want to reach out to her for any therapy sessions, maybe, or any collaborations with her foundation is going to be in the description box. But so <laughs> tell us the, the significance of the name I draw. Adwa means Monday born, and um, actually, I have an adopted family here in Ghana, and I'm about to actually legally change my name to my family name, which is Yaboa, um, but I kept Ajwa because when I arrived in Ghana for the first time, I came on a tour, and the tour group, they took us to uh, the um, castle, the Cape Coast Castle, and they did a naming ceremony for us. And it was it was powerful. It was extremely meaningful for me. It meant a lot to me because that was my. It was like a release. Like it was a release of you know knowing that I, I have autonomy over myself and my body, and that's something that I talk about a lot, especially for um, African American women and our plight and our history in America, where we have never really had autonomy over our own bodies. And that was just like an act of rebellion for me, I guess, for that name. And I have had a very um, shaky history in regards to my name in general. And so it was easy for me to accept this new name because it was something that I was able to take on myself and own it. So mm -hmm. if you don't know, in Ghana, if you're part of the Akan ethnic group, your name is based on the day you're born. So for a girl that's born on Monday, the name is Ajua. So Ajua Akwaba. Madasi. <laughs> good, good, good. <laughs> good. So you, you <laughs> mentioned being a descendant of the survivors of the uh, Tulsa race massacre. How has that yes. um, that type of trauma factored into your life? Woo. So I lived in Oklahoma 
the my early years. I did middle school and high school there continuously. And then the rest of my life, I did the early years. I was in and out visiting, you know, grandparents, things like that. I am lucky that most of my ancestors lived till about 100, 105 on average. That's just average. And so I grew up with my great, great, grandmother, uh, great, great aunts, um, uncles. Um, so all of those people who were around, you know, during that time, actually. So I was able to, you know, sit at the foot, you know, at the, at their feet and listen to them talk and, you know, and, and learn, you know, about our family history and I, along with being able to get DNA testing, but a lot of information I already knew, kind of knew where I came from in Africa. That part of my family didn't really connect with Africa. They didn't really, they were part of the ones that were like, okay, that's a long, you know, that that's a long distance past. You know, they didn't really acknowledge that part of our history. But I was an avid reader when I was a kid. and. Um, and Africa was, we had a set of, I'll say that I'll go back a little bit. We had a set of encyclopedias that came with the house that we lived in. And because I read everything, if it had words on it, I was reading it. And so I set out to read every encyclopedia in the set. And of course, Africa was in the first one. And they had such vivid pictures. And I was just so, it just made me so excited about it but I didn't have anybody to really talk about it with. But when I heard stories about what my family had gone through. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the video. I draw mentioned earlier that she had a relationship on coaching business. And I wanted to take a little bit of time and let you guys know that this video is being sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning platform where you can learn from a variety of different topics. So if you have a skill or a passion that you wanted to teach anyone, you can learn how to do that from Skillshare. For example, how to start a coaching business. There's topics you can learn such as film and video, leadership and management, productivity, and so much more. Currently, I'm taking a course that is being taught by Marquez Brownlee, who is one of the leading content creators in the tech space for the last 10 years. This course is on shooting and creating better content for YouTube so that I can create better content for my viewers. The folks with Skillshare were nice enough to offer you guys one month of free trial of their premium membership. So I put the link in the description box below. Please go ahead and check it out. Tulsa, during the race riots, um, my family, um, they owned a, a, a lot of land. And we actually had our own town called Renty Grove. And it's like, right now, it's part of what they call Jinx, Oklahoma. But Renty Grove was like, you know, on the southern end of town. And I know that like my family, um, our family cemetery is there. And it's... um. Um, it's a historical landmark now. Um, and if you saw my CBS morning piece, you saw they showed me at the family cemetery and everything. I always kind of put that in this, it, it, in this journey that I had to have myself, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Knowing what happened there, knowing what my family went through, I at a young age knew that America wasn't for black people. I don't know how I put that together, but I knew it just, it, it didn't, we didn't go together. We didn't mesh well together. Mm -hmm. And then adding to everything that I dealt with, you know, growing up, up until the point that I made the decision to leave, it just kind of reinforced what I, I surmised when I was a young kid. Being that you lived in Ghana for the past year and a half, what was your life like in Washington, D.C. compared to now, compared to what it is now in Ghana? You know, the funny thing is, is my life is much different. Um, people, people have the idea of Africa being like this third world developing country or, or continent, you know, and you know, people don't, you know, they're poor and, you know, we have those images of, you know, when you're up late and watching the uh, donate to Africa video virtuals and stuff. You know, people, a lot of people have those ideas in their head. Right. And I'm going to tell you, I know Accra is nothing like that. It is a bustling city. It's much like 
you know, New York, less lights and, and frills and so forth. But like anything you can get, you know, as I'm from DC, you know, I lived in New York, anything I could get there, I can get here pretty mm -hmm. much. Um, so in DC, I had my practice, but before that I worked for government, worked for congressmen. So I was in the height of DC, you know, like I was DC socialite. I was in politics. I was in social justice, you know, um, uh, organizations, did community service. I was at, you know, mayor's balls and, you know, I've served you know as uh on committees and city committees and wow. i was doing everything i was doing everything i was in the mix I, I was completely in the mix and so people were like why would you leave that to you know but i wasn't happy that that wasn't you know you can have all the money in the world you can have all the material things i tell people here in ghana all the time that dream about going to america and I said, you know, you're looking at just the financial aspect of it, but you don't understand how hard you have to work just to get the things that you think that you want. Right. And once you get those things, you're not really happy still. You know, I said that the things that you that really make us happy in life are community and family and friends and people around us that love us and support us. And I just didn't really have that when you know while living in the states my my family you know like like i said most of my family were older and so i don't have many people left i have one great aunt left she just turned 90 a few days ago and wow. i have an uncle and you know so most of my family's gone and so i was like you know it, it's it, i've come here to ghana and i've developed you know family you know, I have a, a great group of friends and yeah, so I do lunch, I do brunch with my girlfriends on Sunday, like I normally do with lots of mimosas. Um, you know, I get my hair done, nails done, you know, all the, you know, stuff that women like to do. Spa, I have a masseuse that comes to my house. Um, <laughs> so um, the greatest difference is it's a lot cheaper to live here, so, but yeah. Yeah, my life is pretty much the same. When I came, I went, I came with the tour group. And so, of course, they showed us all the tour stuff, right? Um, but what I saw was a lot of opportunity. Um, and I saw how I could have peace of mind. One thing, one advantage I can say that I, I have had that most people across the United States most black people across the United States have not had mm -hmm. is, and I just kind of realized how um, lucky I have been is that I'm from DC and DC, everyone knows the chocolate city. So right. I come from DC where it was 90 plus percent black. Mm -hmm. So I, I have had that experience so coming to Ghana, I was like, oh, this back, you know, this like DC back in the day. You know? right. So, um, so <laughs> I was, oh, this is great because DC has changed drastically from when I was younger. So I was happy to have that dynamic again. Um, and it, 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 it's, it cracks me up sometimes when I hear people say, oh my gosh, there's so many black people. And I'm like, where are you from? And then I have to re remember that, you know, we are only 12% of the population in the United States. So the majority yeah. of people, you know, don't experience, you know, a place where it's majority black and people looking like you. So, yeah. So, Ajua, being that you're a descendant of the survivors of the uh, the Tulsa Race Massacre, there's a doctor by the name of Joy DeGruy, who's also a social worker uh, that you mentioned earlier. And mm -hmm. she wrote a book called uh, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. How has yes. that had an effect on your life and the effect of Black America from the trauma that existed from the transatlantic slave trade? <laughs> Definitely, she has had such an influence on me, and, and I think a lot of my um, fellow uh, Black therapists, as you know, we have to kind of adjust how we deliver therapy, you know, and how we interact with our African-American clients, um, apart from what we learn in school from the Freudian methods and the, you know, Erickson's and so on and so forth, but we have to, you know, adjust things. So when she came out with that book, it was just kind of, um, you know, a game changer for us as clinicians to kind of have a theory and put into words what we know as our 
we ourselves deal with in our own lives, but also uh, what our clients that we work with, they deal with in their lives. So um, one of the things that is really important to note is that anyone trying to make the transition out of America to wherever you decide to go. And I, I, I always tell people, you don't have to come to Africa, but if you make, you know, if you finally get to a place where you just can't take America anymore, is where you're going to find your, your peace, wherever that might be. But when you make that decision, I suggest for people to go to therapy because there's so much trauma that is that we, we're walking around with and we don't even realize how deep it goes. I didn't even realize as a clinician how deep it went until I left. And I knew I was getting to a place where I was struggling. And that's why I really just kind of, I, I had plans to leave and like I had a five-year plan, but I ended up at year three saying, okay, forget this. I just can't do this anymore because wow. I myself was nearing like a nervous breakdown. And then COVID being locked down, you know, and I was supposed to actually leave uh, April 1st before mm -hmm the lockdown and then Ghana closed its its um, borders like on the 24th or something like that. So I ended up being stuck in America longer and the anxiety and, and it was like people were home, stuck at home. So there were, you know, sh people shoot outside just shooting or setting off fireworks or, you know, and all of these things contribute to your trauma. So yeah. you think about is going back to, you know, Dr. DeGruy's theory of, you know, ancestral, you know, um, generational trauma. It's in our DNA. It's it's a marker on our little DNA molecules mm. um, that causes so many different um, things that impact our daily lives. So you just think that you're born, born just born. That being born is a traumatic experience. Yeah. <laughs> you you know you think about all of those things before a person's even born. Then once they're born. What environment are they going into? Even if you're a child going into the best of economic circumstances, the world itself, the United States itself, does not support health driving individuals, especially those of color. Uh, Joy, you painted a very vivid picture of what's, what's happening to Black America right now uh, and, and has been happening for a long time. thought that it was important to ask you that question because uh, be, in your line of work, you're able to look at this type of trauma from a different perspective? You know, in my line of work, um, you know, I see it. I, I'm, I'm having to, I'm tasked with having to help people deal with their trauma. And you just mentioned, you know, those people coming from Africa to America. And we kind of chatted about this beforehand. Um, I have a lot of clients who are first generation, second generation um, people, you know, whose parents moved to the States for a better life or education or job opportunities. And, you know, them coming from a place of where, you know, everyone looks like them and there's not this race, this um, overt racism. They have no idea what racism really looks like, how it plays out, all the microaggressions and so forth. They just come, they, you know, they focus on jobs, education or whatever. They raise their kids, but most of them end up in predominantly white neighborhoods and their kids go to school with mostly white kids. So mm -hmm. they don't understand, you know, the, uh, really the dynamics of race and racism. And a lot of them are now adults and they're in, you know, the workplace. And now they're starting to understand what racism is and how it shows its ugly head in, you know, in the form of for microaggressions. And they don't know how to deal with it because their parents are like, well, that, that's, you know, they, they don't think that's racism. You know, they have no idea. And so I have to do a lot of coaching to help them understand what it is, what they're dealing with, what it looks like, and, and how to get through this without losing their jobs. So we have, you know, a lot of education that has to happen on both sides, right? And um, and so for us African Americans um, who may be moving out, you know, out of the country, we have to acknowledge what we have dealt with. I have all the tools, right? Mm -hmm. But my first experience when it, it really hit me in the face 
was I was living in Ethiopia before I came to Ghana and I had an experience with the police and this was during, you know, during the height still of COVID and the rule, one of the rules um, was that you could not have more than three people in a car at a time. And I had gone to see a friend. I was with a friend and I'd gone to see another friend. Um, and my friend offered to give us a ride home. And, and my friend who he was um, in a wheelchair because he had had an accident. And so uh, we could just forgot. We forgot about the rules. So we're driving and there's a fork in the road and we're supposed to go left, but we were veering over to the right. At the corner of my eye, I saw a police officer uh, on a motorcycle. And first, I didn't think much about it. But then as we're veering to the right, I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, we're getting pulled over. Panic, just panic inside of me. And, I, and I'm and i saying to myself, logically, OK, I can't freak out because then I'll set things off in the car, you know, and everyone else. And I don't know how this is going to play out. I don't know how the police are anywhere else. And then I really panicked because the driver pulled over and he takes his seatbelt off. He jumps out the car and I'm thinking inside like, no, what are you doing? No, like we're going to be killed. Like I literally was like, no, this is it. I'm dying. I'm never, I, I'm never going to live to tell a story. Wow. My friend that was sitting next to me, he is an international lawyer and um, law professor who understands what we go through in America. And yeah. he started, and of course they're speaking in Amharic and I didn't understand what was going on. So he started talking to me. He's like, oh, oh, we forgot. You know, we're not supposed to have more than three people in the car. And then he, the guy, the driver also go, pops open the trunk. So I'm really panicking. Like, what is he doing? God, what uh -huh. are you doing? Like, we don't do this, you know? But he was showing him he had his wheelchair and the officer was like, oh, you know, basically like, oh, OK, you know, just remember the rule. So we, the, by law, a person who has a handicap or something is considered half a person. Hmm. So we were able to get by <laughs> without a ticket or anything because my friend was considered half a person in a wheelchair. So we could he let us. Oh, but he was like, okay, well, you know, basically was telling him, get better, you know, yeah. do what the doctor says and so forth. But I'm like, what the hell just happened? I'm sorry, but I got home and Anon, I just broke down crying because I was so scared. And I was like, nobody should be that terrified yeah. of the police yeah. anywhere. And that was where I was confronted with my own trauma. Yeah, because you've been programmed to to think that way based on your life here. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So can you say that you're in Ghana for good? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> yeah. I've, 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 stayed, I've put down roots. So Congratulations. <laughs> yes. Congratulations. Yes. I'm really Thank proud of you. you. Thank you. Right here. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah. So final words for any sisters who are professionals here in the United States, like you, like yourself at one time, who are mm -hmm. maybe considering moving to some part of Africa, hopefully Ghana, but any part of Africa, mm -hmm. what would you say? I would encourage them to do it. I mean, it's on your heart. And first and foremost, like I said, I can't re you know say this enough. Go to therapy. Go to therapy. Work through your trauma because you don't want to bring that with you because it can make your transition difficult. Um, one of the things with my foundations, um, Soaring Sisters Foundation, um, we help women to kind of lay out a plan of action on how to make the transition. And then I am a dating relationship coach. And one of the things that I try to help women understand is the difference in dating and relationships and marriage and how um, to navigate that safely because we have a lot of sisters come in 
to the continent they're meeting guys but they're they're becoming victims of love scams and so you know because they don't understand the differences in how you know things are are done in regards to relationships and in marriage right um so they're jumping in you know feet first and you know so it's just a lot of a lot of things that one needs to know um but i don't want that to deter anyone because you can have a great life here wherever you decide to go on the continent well Adwa, mm -hmm. thank you so much it was a pleasure and really an honor to get this opportunity to talk to you i want to thank you so much for checking out this content please keep watching the channel please make sure that you like subscribe share uh with your friends and family and we on behalf of Adwa, this is your man king anand signing out and we'll catch you on the next video thank you bye bye everyone bye.